so you know, I have to come in and out. Is that going? Yeah. But uh, I used to be out a lot more, you know, yeah. trying to get deals going, and, you know, the usual. What I want to start out with is to ask you about your new project, which is Diamond Dead. Right. Well, that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about it? What's the uh, plot? It's about a dead rock and roll band <laughs> mm -hmm. brought back from the dead by uh, one of the roadies that makes a deal with death. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's a really fun, you know, spin on it's a rock and roll zombie flick, you know, is what it is. I understand it's a uh, parody uh, type where it makes fun of horror, is that right? It, yeah, not really. I mean, it treats it very gently. It doesn't really, it's not a comedy, you know, in the Kevin Williamson, it's not that self-reverential Kevin Williamson type humor, but uh, it, it just, uh, you know, it just has, it's, it's tongue in cheek. It's more, uh, more witty than anything else. Um, now the band that comes back from the dead, would you classify them as zombies? Yes, they are. That's the problem. <laughs> Why is it a problem? Well, if they were so, she makes a deal with death to bring them back uh, to life. Mm -hmm. And when they come back to life, they're all messed up. So she pisses her off, and then she spends the movie trying to outwit death and not have to live up to her end of the bar. Now this would be your first zombie film since uh, Dawn of the Dead. I mean, yeah. since the Day of the Dead. Yeah, if it's if it's first, I don't know. Uh, Scott, Scott Free, uh, good. How are you? Oh, peachy. Thank you. <laughs> I like to our soup real quick. Today's soup is a minestrone. I also have a Manhattan clam chowder and gazpacho. Okay. Can I start y'all off with uh, some fresh squeezed lemonade or? Uh, yeah, I have a lemonade. You we'll have a lemonade. All right. Good. Um, three four. Sure. Okay. I'm going to get a uh, chicken club sandwich. Yeah. Would you like french fries, coleslaw, or fruit? Um, coleslaw. And a uh, diet coke. Okay. Uh, can I get a piece of bread and cheese salad? Mm -hmm. No chicken on there? Uh, I'll just have a, a large lemonade. Lemonade mission. No. Just the lemonade? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Tuna salad sandwich, please. French fries, coleslaw, or fruit? French fries. And to drink, sir? Uh, can I have a, a uh, Virgin Mary, no vodka? Thanks. Some water. <clears throat> now, am I right so in knowing I, that... I don't uh, know. Well, well, you said... I don't know if it's going to be the next film. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Scott Free, uh, Tony Scott, Tony and Ridley Scott's company, signed on recently as producers of the thing. So you don't have any cast that. That's order. what we're doing. Yeah, right. We doing just that. had a meeting the other day. So I don't know, you know, how quickly that'll come together. Yeah. And uh, the, I, have, I have a deal on a, on a fourth zombie film that looks, uh, at the moment, looks closer. Looks like it might happen first. Dead Reckoning. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Can you tell us anything about the story at all? Uh, I can give you a sort of a thumbnail. It's about ignoring the problem. People are getting back together and little protected societies mm -hmm. and uh, as if nothing was going on but even though they haven't figured out you know what the problem is but the dead are still coming back to life. and this, the protagonists are people that have to go out and you know get supplies and so, forth. so that's pretty much it everybody talks about uh, the dead trilogy Do you consider this part of that group as a continuation or its own separate story yeah it's a fourth film uh, deals with the you know the same phenomenon at a different point in time it's the other ones they really haven't been sequels to each other they've just been you know the same problem as, as time goes on so this is the that kind of thing same thing why do you think the time is right is it because of the uh, universal success with dawn of the dead no I, I had this script for a couple of years in fact i tried to pitch it and then Right, I, I sent it around right before 9/11, and then 9/11 came. And everybody wanted to do, you know, friendly, uh, gentler movies, so it fell apart for a little while. And then it was—it's been tied up at a studio for some time, and it looks now like we finally have a, a deal on it. I, I don't—I think it's—it it, it has really nothing to do with uh, the remake of Dawn. Yeah, I'm gonna probably be the first person of 
probably hundreds going to be asking you this weekend. What did you think of the remake of Dawn of the Dead? It was better than I expected it was going to be. Uh, I thought it was an action, you know, but it was an action film. I didn't think it, it had its, it lost its soul, or it's, you know, in a, in a way it lost its reason for being. And I don't like, uh, you know, fast-moving zombies, so yeah. that wasn't my cup of tea <laughs> at all. But uh, it was, uh, it was a, you know, it was a fun ride. It had a couple of a couple of good action set pieces and a couple of neat script ideas, and it was better than I ex expected. That it, I, I was, I was thinking it would be just uh, nothing, and I thought it was, you know, pretty entertaining. Do you think it's uh, true to say that they didn't center around the characters as much as you did? It was more bang bang action. But it seemed that way to me, but I, I read like a Gannett review which said it last. We know what these characters are about, so, you know, go figure. Wow. I can't, you know, you just you do, your, do your thing. And I just have to ask this, I don't want to entirely uh, dwell on that, but uh, I take it it was through you that you sold the rights to Universal. I mean, did you solely own the rights to Dawn of the Dead? Oh, no, I didn't own them at all. Didn't I wasn't, at all. No. So that's how it came about. You really had no involvement with No, something. none whatsoever. My ex-partner had the rights. When uh, I when I left, uh, he and I had, had a, formed a company way back when, and uh, it was a public company. And when I when I left, uh, you know, he wound up with the rights to that and a couple of the King projects, and you know, so I really had nothing to say about it. I imagine it's pretty gut wrenching to see somebody taking on your baby. Isn't it? No, Not really. <laughs> no, everybody says to. Everybody says to Stephen King, how do you feel about these movie guys ruining your books? And yeah. Steve just says, you're not ruined. Here they are on the bookshelf, you know. So, and that's sort of the way I feel about it. That movie, my movie exists, and uh, it is what it is. And, you know, so this one is what it is. And you don't worry about associations. Somebody that's uninformed and says, oh, yeah, that movie's really bad at George Romero. And, no, he wasn't involved. I've even said that movie's really bad at all. <laughs> no, I haven't. <clears throat> I think maybe anybody that would that would say that yeah. probably wouldn't think that the movie was you that bad. What about the girl who uh, <laughs> loved Tom Gordon? Where yeah. are you with that? We're in, uh, we've, our, the sales agents were at Cannes with it. They're just getting back, they'll be back this week. And they have, they've raised a lot of European money. And you know, they'll, they will now try to get U.S. distribution. And there's a couple of people that are interested in it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just in that at that point of trying to raise the financing. Let, let me ask you this: either it's the fact that you're a workaholic, you can probably attest to that, or possibly what I'm going to say here uh, is part of the method of your madness, as you might say, a point of phrase, <laughs> that you have so many projects going at once. Does that kind of like guarantee you that at least one of them is going to make it? To no, the no. That's I've not never, why you do so many. No, I've never. You know, what, um, for a lot of years. Tom Gordon. Tom Gordon. Like, uh, four we, years, four and a half. Years. Yeah, we've had. Five years? And, and uh, and the zombie film is a you know it's a script that I wrote. I've done a couple of redrafts on it, but I wrote it before 9/11, so they've been sitting around. And Tom Gordon the same way. I wrote the first draft and then did a redraft and then a, another draft on it. And uh, you know it's just been trying to raise money. Look and, how long it takes. And, you know, yeah. it takes a long time. It's and Diamond Dead came in. I mean, the producer is an old friend of mine, Andrew Gaddy, who I've known for for ages. And, uh, you know, he just called me up when he, 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 he's the guy that hooked up with Richard Hartley, uh, Rocky Horror. Uh, mm -hmm. And basically they had set designs, music was already recorded, demos were, were recorded already of the music. And uh, by the time I even got involved in it, and then I did a pass on the script. But no, no, I have I, something there. <laughs> uh, I have, I've written a couple of other spec scripts that I don't know whether anything's going to happen with them or not, you know, but I, I, I do have, a, you know, some stuff in the drawer there, and if you, if you get, sometimes when, you know, when there's some action, and when people see that you're doing stuff, then all of a sudden other people want to do stuff, so, um, I don't know, it's, it's a very tough business, particularly for my kind of thing, because my stuff is, you know, maverick kind of stuff, it's not major studio time usually. You're not concerned that uh, rock and roll zombies might be compared with punk zombies from Return of the Living Dead, which of course you had nothing to do with. I hope not. Yeah. It's very different. I mean, this is very different. I, I, it's just, it's a really neat thing. The music is terrific and it's, a, it's really fun, you know, so uh, yeah. I certainly wouldn't. Uh, 
think of it as anywhere close. But right. um, I understand you were shopping around a Dracula script, and you were hoping that ABC was going to pick it up. ABC, I, we weren't shopping it. ABC hired us to do it. I mean, from the top. Why did it fall through? I think I don't know. I think they decided to do Kingdom Hospital instead, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to do another vampire thing. But it's still there. You know. It's a great script. Uh, Why was it saying? different? What, what was? Go back and do it, or? Yeah. There is. There's always that question. So it's still there and kind of waiting to see what happens. Or? Right. Was it more Universal type Dracula or no, more updated? No, it was Stoker all the way. Stoker all the way. Classical. And that's what they wanted, and that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And it's really never been done. I mean, there's so much in that book that nobody's ever touched. What can you tell us about a film that I guess you called one of your favorites, which is The Ill? I, I don't know why everybody talks so much about The Ill. Really? It's a five-year-old thing. Internet yeah. yeah. It's a five-year-old project. Um, produ a couple of producers came to me out of New York, asked me if I wanted to do it. I rewrote the... I said yes. I rewrote the script because I like the guys. And they went to Cannes one year and, you know, had posters up saying George Romero, George Romero is the ill. And there's never been a deal on it. And uh, I haven't heard from those guys for like, you know, a couple of years. But it's still, uh, I don't know, for some reason the internet keeps that one alive. I don't so know why. you wouldn't say it's one of your favorites? Hmm? You wouldn't say it's one of your favorites? Either. No. Right and now. That one uh, went directly to video too, didn't it? Which? Oh, was Bruiser went directly to video. That's Bruiser, right. yeah. What about Bruiser? What do you think about that film? I love it. That's, That's the one favorite. I was saying That's it was his favorite. That's right. I got mixed yeah. up here. Absolutely. Why do you think it's one of your favorites? There's so much that goes into that, you know. Partly, partly what you think of it as a film, and I think it's a pretty interesting idea, but even more than that is how successfully you think you executed it and what kind of an experience it was making it, you know. And we were really working with wonderful people. It was just a wonderful time. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to bother you, but will you be signing autographs for the regular people who didn't buy the gold passes? I think so. I think that's... I don't know. You know I don't know. I just hiring him in on this. I don't yeah. know what you're doing. Okay. So we don't know anything. When a film uh, goes directly to video, is, is that a feeling to you that it didn't succeed as well as you would like to have had? I mean, back in the olden days of movies, everything was geared towards putting in a theater. Now video is pretty popular. It's been movies in the life stand. If you have something to go directly to video, are you disappointed? Yes. I mean, because... Uh, or, I mean, I'd much rather have seen it get a theatrical release. Mm -hmm. But they didn't... You know, there's always a story behind everything. We made that movie for a French company called Canal Plus. By the time we... They financed it 100%. By the time we shot it, finished it, Canal Plus had been swallowed up by Vivendi and then by Universal. And the guys we were talking to weren't in the office anymore. And, um, you know, it's not a Universal picture. But, you know, it should, it should have been a little release from Canal Plus, maybe in Europe first, and try to get it going somewhere. But, you know, I think the distribution guys at Universal just looked at it and said, what the hell is this? Uh, it's a very quirky little movie. I'm not meant to be a mass market film at all. How do you compare it to Martin? Huh? How do you compare it to Martin? Uh, uh, favorably. <laughs> I love Martin and Bruiser are, and, and Knight Riders, I guess, are my favorite films of mine. And uh, I like Bruiser a lot. I just I think it's I think it's a, an okay idea. I'm, and uh, you know. I think that we were able to pull it off well. So now before Bruiser, that, that's the main thing. What I what about Martin is uh, I always felt that that was the best executed, or it was the closest the closest of my films uh, to what I had originally written on the page. And and Bruiser probably comes in second. And, and, uh, now before uh, Bruiser, you did the dark half. There was a long span in between there that you didn't have anything out. Is there right. a reason for that? You're just writing or taking off yeah. time? Or? It was very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh,
All around the car. Thank you. We had a housekeeping deal at New Line for a couple of years, and they never made a movie with us, my partner and I, my new partner, Peter Grimwell. And then um, we took a project out of there, out of away from New Line. When we left New Line, we had the, we wound up with the rights to one project that then was picked up by MGM, and they developed it for like a year and a half. Never made it. Same project went to Fox under Chris Columbus's company. They developed it for like another year. And the studio never made the movie. And meantime, you know, I was just completely frustrated. And I lost the mummy because of that project. I was going to ask you about that. I was supposed yeah. to interview you back when I was living in Florida. I was told that you were being connected with that. Yeah, and it was green lit. It was ready to go. And they wouldn't let us off the contract on this other film that they never made. And so I wound up, you know, losing the mummy. And then we worked. After we were still at Fox, we worked on Goosebumps for a while, and then um, Fox out got into some kind of a feud with Scholastic, and they decided not to make that one. And you know, so that was after that. I mean, that was years. You know, seven years, six or seven years. I take it you were probably a fan of Universal Horror. But that oh, sure. Been a real kick for you to. Have, uh, it would have, yeah, really. Yeah. Mine was very different than. <laughs> I mean, mine was really sort of a homage. It was a, you know, very noir and really a throwback to, to the old one. And, um, nothing at all like what they eventually did to it. But it was greenlit. It was ready to roll, and we couldn't get out of the contract. So all the frustration that came over those things, I just took off and said, man, I just wanted to get out of the Hollywood, you know, development hell. So I went and wrote Bruiser, and, you know, it took us a while to get the money for that, but we finally got it from from Canal. I really admire the fact that uh, both you and your wife just remain in Pennsylvania rather than <laughs> living out here in Hollywood, as they say. Uh, is there any reason for that? Is this that you're a homeboy and that's the way it is? Uh, well, I grew up in New York City, so I went to Pittsburgh to go to school, college, yeah. and fell in love with it. And Chris is from Pittsburgh. We like it, uh, you know. Yeah, we we stayed there because we thought we could still make movies there, but it's getting tougher. Yeah. yeah. Imagine it is. It was a nice place to raise Let me ask you this. Uh, your movie, Monkey Shines, I can imagine you've got to have an interesting story about working with a monkey and <laughs> perhaps things that went wrong. Well, it was just really, it was really hard. I mean, we wound up, we shot more footage on those monkeys than we shot on the actors. Really? Just trying to get, you know, little moments, little reactions from them that looked, that were, you know, that played into the script. Um, and it's funny, monkeys will interact with humans. Uh, they don't distinguish between humans and other apes. And um, <clears throat> so when we needed the monkey to look aggressive, they'll select. A male monkey will select a male human. And, and become subservient to that male. And at the same, they will also select an enemy from, from among humans. So we have to find uh, one of the trainers, this, this lead monkey, the one with the teeth, hate it. So whenever we needed it to look aggressive, we would just call this girl's name was Chris, and so we'd go, Chris, Chris, and Chris would come in and the monkey would just go nuts. So but we have to synthesize all that stuff. And when we needed when we needed the monkey to uh, you know be amorous with the guy, we had to wait for the, the trainer called us up early on the morning when she when the monkey it was a female went into heat. And the first human male that she would see that day, she would be uh, throw herself at, you know, sexually, all day. <laughs> so we waited for that day to shoot those scenes, and she, and so all that stuff is real. She's actually coming on to him. But uh, so it was pretty interesting. It was pretty interesting stuff. They're not very, they're not very reliable. That's a real program, that Helping Hands program. Yeah. It was but, really difficult. But they, we had a couple of real monkeys from the program. But they extract their teeth when they put them in homes with 
paraplegics or quadriplegics because they're not that reliable. And um, we needed one with teeth, so this one was not in the program. And it wound up just being a smart monkey. It wound up doing most of the most of the behaviors. So uh, I'm trying to let you eat in between questions right, here. That's all right. What is the uh, word on the uh, possible remake of Day of the Dead and the Crazies? Well, again, I won't be involved in the making of either of those films. Crazies is a real deal. Paramount. And, uh, you know, they're going to go remake it. And I'll, I'll be an executive producer on it. But I won't be involved in scripting or directing. And, um, you know, except for whatever godfathering they let me do. And the other day of the dead, none of us are, not even my ex-partner. I think a long time ago, I think, he sold the rights to... Uh, oh, what, what the hell? Taurus. Taurus. Now, we've heard... I heard it's finished. It's been made. Really? It's I, I, we, don't, we really don't have a person to know anything, but at a couple film festivals, a lot of the fans are saying that it's made already. Wow. And it's going direct to video, but we don't know anything. And they don't consult you folks at all? No. Why should they? Oh, well, that's a mistake. <laughs> well, my opinion. I don't know that I would have wanted to be consulted, you know. I would have advised them to drop it. Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you a question here. It seems that there's a great resurgence in 70s horror and horror in general, but specifically 70s horror. What do you think that means for pioneers like yourself, Toby Hooper? Uh, do you think that that will give you an opportunity to make new films that you maybe couldn't have made before because your name is back in the news again? That would be nice. <laughs> That'd be nice. I, it generally doesn't have that kind of an effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, because over the last 10 years, horror has had a couple of yeah. resurgences. And <clears throat> Me, I don't know, and I, I, you know, I can't really speak for Toby, but I think people are a little afraid of me that I'm going to be, you know, too too difficult or be too much of a maverick or whatever. Yeah. So I don't think there's certainly nothing automatic about it. Um, anybody that sort of knows my producing record, you know, should be able to look at that and say, well, he's always delivered on time, and but a boom. But they don't, you know, they don't think that way. Now it's been uh, said for a long time that. Night of Living Dead is public domain, but that was done by mistake, right? I mean, it was an accident. Yeah, it was an accident. What but it is there? true. It is public domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened? There? Our title, we finished the film completely, printed it, and threw it in the trunk of the car. Drove it to New York to see if anybody wanted to look at it or show it. And our title was Night of the Flesh Eaters. And we had put the copyright bug on the title card instead of at the end of the film. And when they changed the title, it came off. And nobody noticed that it wasn't put back on by anybody. Would that matter? I mean, would it still be registered with the Copyright Office even though you didn't have the uh, notice on it? Nope. You so had to have the notice on it. We fought it for three years. Wow. We couldn't, never won it back. Longer, eight years, never won it. It had to be gut wrenching. Just one of those dumb mistakes. But. <clears throat> You know, we really weren't making any money on it anyway. I mean, there were so many, even before people realized that it was, you know, public domain. Yeah. It had outlived its earning power, you know. So, I mean, there are new license deals for video, and we still get legitimate companies still negotiate with us. That is, the original company, Image 10, that made the film because they don't want to be out there without approvals. So it hasn't really been a problem. What little, you know, what little income it's made over the last few years off video it has come into Image 10. So. Let me ask you this. They said that one of the reasons that It's a Wonderful Life became so popular is because of its access to everybody because it was public domain for a while. Uh, do you think that helped the film and yourself become legendary because it was public domain? I don't think so, because it happened before anybody realized. I mean, the, that film, about two years after it, after its initial release, it started to get attention in Europe and 
started in France and then sort of spread out. And, and the Museum of Modern Art recognized it. And all of that happened before anybody knew, including us, <laughs> that there was a copyright problem. It was just one of those things that slipped away, you know, without anybody really even realizing it. So let me ask you this, and uh, we'll see what you have to say if you want to say it all. Uh, there's been a lot of rumors of a little rift between you and John Russo. Is that true? No. Not really? No. Maybe you'd like to set that straight here. Yeah, Everybody no, John and I, we see each other all the time. He lives in Pittsburgh. He's, he's starting a school, production school. And I, you know, I, I told him I'd teach a couple of courses there. And no, so, we, I mean, we're still friends. I don't agree with all the stuff that he does, and we, I've told him, you know, we talk about it. But no, we're still, we're still good buddies. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I wanted to ask your opinion on the, the one project that he was involved in, uh, which I was very surprised you weren't, but maybe for your own personal reasons, which was the uh, Night of the Living Dead 30th Anniversary Edition where he filmed the new scenes. Yeah. Do you have any opinions about that? Did it's one of it? the things I told him I thought was uh, dumb. Uh -huh. So you saw it then? He showed it to Chris and I one day when it was just finished. And <laughs> hoping that we would have nice things to say, and neither of us did. I just thought it was ridiculous. I don't know why they have to do that. It wasn't a, that one wasn't a, about the protection of copyright or reestablishing copyright or anything. The remake was. <clears throat> it's the principal reason we did the colorized version in the remake was to try to help reestablish some kind of copyright. But what do you think about it, Chris? Jackson? About the uh, 30th anniversary. Oh, it's yeah. I didn't really think that it, it matched. I, could have, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was tasteless, yeah. ridiculous, made no sense, horrible. So you think it's probably better to do just a total remake than to try to add new scenes? It's kind of like a George Lucas Star Wars thing where he just adds to the original. Yeah, I didn't, you know. Yeah. So what about your film Hungry Wives? You said that you really didn't think that film uh, stood up to the fact and thought the acting was very bad? I thought everything about it was just, it was way underfinanced. There were a couple of good performances. But everybody else was just, you know, <clears throat> non-actors. We didn't have enough money to finish it. We, the guys that were, that were financing it, um, stopped sending checks after a while. We had to finish it on a lot less than we expected that we had. So it's a film. I love the idea, and it's one I'd like to. It's the only one of mine that I, I would really like to revisit or remake for, for the sake of the film. Uh, so, I don't know if there'll ever be an opportunity to do that or not, but uh, I'd like to give it a shot. I want to find out in your movie, Martin, there was a film called Vampire's Kiss. I believe it was made afterwards. Yeah, it was made Yeah, later. and it kind of reminded me of Martin. Did you ever see Vampire's Kiss? No. Not really? It's almost the same kind of plot, where it was a kind of disturbed young man, and he thought he was a vampire, and was he, or was he just crazy? And... I didn't see it. I don't know. I don't so do you look at Martin as more of a horror film or a psychological uh, piece? Or? I've always looked at it more as a, you know, psychological thriller in a way about a guy that's, you know, probably nuts. And uh, I don't believe he's a vampire. I mean, in, a, in the supernatural sense, he is in that he drinks blood. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, I was always just trying to do a portrait of, you know. Somebody that was trapped somewhere, you know, between between myth mythology and family mythology, and his own impressions, his own sort of warped. Uh, you think that's one you might remake someday? No, I don't. Again, if it gets remade, Richard Rubenstein will do it. He's got those rights to it. I wouldn't want to remake that. It was successful enough that I didn't. I wouldn't have remade Dawn, but so. What about the ending of Martin? Were you uh, somewhat apprehensive about the ending where Martin was killed? Was that the original intent, or was that like a last-minute idea? Oh, no, that was always there. Always there? Yeah. The one I changed my mind on was Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. His original script had them dying. Killing them. They killed themselves. He with the gun and her with the helicopter. 
and <clears throat> I realized I had I had done it that way because I was thinking of it as uh, even though it's not a sequel by you know by Writers Guild terms, I was thinking of it as uh, you know revisiting Night of the Living Dead texturally texturally a sequel. But then I realized it's just completely different personality, and as I was shooting it, I was trying to make it more comic book and more a reflection of the, the time, the de different decade. And I decided that it just wouldn't be right, you know, to do that. It wasn't, it's not as dark a film. So we, we switched, I switched horses and decided not to kill him. You're a big comic book fan. You're writing comic books right now for DC, is that right? Yeah, I'm writing a limited, a limited uh, six issue limited series. Okay. I don't know what to call them in comic book. Did you have anything to do with the Dawn of the Dead comic book? No. Not at all. No. So do you think your love for comic books perhaps inspired you to be a filmmaker? No. I think movies. I love movies. I think, you know, the EC comic books made me a fan of horror. But I didn't decide to make movies because I dug comic books, you know. To me, they were two separate deals. So what actually scares you? Iraq, the bomb, you know, that real stuff that people do to each other. <laughs> much more than I'm not a guy that gets you know I'm not afraid of ghosts at all you don't so. believe in the supernatural at all no I wouldn't go that far anything else that's okay go ahead go ahead no, I'm fine I'm, I'm immortalized no I'm no I'm fine too thank you, thank you. Um, so I I wouldn't say that I don't believe. I mean, I'm always looking for something interesting. You know, I'd love to see a UFO. I'd love to see a ghost. But I doubt that it's going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm interested and I read a lot about it. And, you know, maybe most of that is looking for a flat idea. We'll take care of that. No, no, no. no, no really, no. we'll take care of it. We don't have a budget. It's a B-movie magazine, but I'll take care of it first. No, 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 no. Please. Are you sure? Yeah. Because I'd be very happy to. No, thank you. It's an honor to be sitting here with you folks. Well, thank you. It's our, our pleasure. French? Um, anyway. I wanted to find out, I understand that, uh, of which a person that I used to trade movies with is actually an extra in Dawn, that they received uh, $20 and a uh, shirt. Is that right, the extras? On Dawn? I didn't Dawn think anybody got 20 bucks. Like a dollar. A dollar? <laughs> I thought it was a buck. I heard it was a dollar for Day of the Dead. I think it was all made for... I can't remember, Dave. For some reason, Dawn did... My memory... It was always a buck. Yeah. Unless it was somebody that had something special to do. Maybe special zombies got maybe 20 bucks. Oh, there you go. I don't know. But maybe it might have gotten... I didn't think we were paying them at all. Well, you had to pay something. You had to pay something. Yeah, either a dollar or twenty. I think that was it. Was it SAG? I don't even remember. Was it SAG? Was that SAG? No. I remember my friend telling me. He said, "I sat down in a chair, a makeup chair. He said, do whatever you want to do. And it was such an honor just to be there. You know, you just like put an ad in the paper to find extras to be in a movie, or?" I think no. I don't think we ever did ads in the paper. No, we had actually John Amplis, who played Martin was a friend of ours and he knew a lot of actors around, you know, he teaches acting. And he worked on that, right? Recruiting people and didn't you? Yeah, and yeah I did. Well, we he did. A whole, of people. a whole bunch of people yeah, that were just... told everybody they knew. Working the phone. And a lot of people didn't hurt for a zombie. <laughs> to this day, people talk about you. Know? Well, we would go. Yeah. You know, seriously. <laughs> we went, uh, we actually went to work as zombies at the local theme parks during Six the... Six Flags. Is that right? like a novel for such huge horror. But he was doing it wrong. And he was like, you can't be slow. Zombies are fast. Are like, you? No, they're Ooh, not. I was doing the George Romero zombie. <laughs> I kept getting yelled kept at. kept telling me I was doing it wrong. <laughs> Isn't that funny? When did they become, when did they become fast? I mean, you know, what happened? 
Well, I wouldn't assume the dead would be fast. <laughs> I don't get it. So when you used to watch zombie movies back when you were young, uh, yeah. let's say Bela Lugosi, White Zombie, or some of the earlier ones, yeah. I Married, I Walk with Zombie, movies like that, uh, did you used to watch them and wish that they would be more graphic? Because yours, of course, had many graphic scenes with yeah. you know, entrails. And I used to think all the stuff, you know, because coming off EC comic books, nothing ever seemed to pay off that way. Yeah. So, yeah. And I understand in your films that you use basically animal parts and colon testings. And yes, we did. And there had to be some stories where people got sick, were there? No, nobody actually ate the really vile stuff. It was just, uh, it was hard to be around occasionally. So like when they chewed on it, that was really animal intestine? No, some of it was liver, I mean, from the butcher shop. I don't think anyone actually, actually, uh, dug into the real intestines or anything. Did that bother you that Universal seemed to kind of like wimp out on that because they really, it had one brief flash and then that was it. They didn't really like have yeah, yeah, Like I say, I, it didn't bother me. Nothing bothers me that way. It's their thing, you know. Let me ask you this. I know for a fact uh, in interviewing Rob Zombie with House of Thousand Corpses that big studios a lot of times have a problem with cannibalism. Now, in Dawn of the Dead, one of your characters explained that it wasn't really cannibalism because they would not eat each other, they would eat the humans, which were like a different species. Uh, did you write that in to kind of like get away from uh, studio pressures of... of no, we didn't have a studio at that time. Oh. We were allowed to do anything we wanted. So you were about to distribution, it. about theaters not wanting to show it because of cannibalism? No, because we knew that they would... Re well, at that time, we didn't have a U.S. distribution yet. We thought we might have to cut it, but... Um, and that wasn't... The, you know, we didn't have to, because uh, UATC put it out without a rating. And left so it that out. wasn't written for that reason? No. I wanted to explain it. Yeah. Why, was, why was it put out without a rating? Was there a reason behind so it? That, it could be harder. Otherwise, it had an X. It had an X. At that time, an X was like four minutes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have problems with the MPA with uh, Martin. With the, a little bit. The arm with the yeah. Right. What Not, happened you know, there? It was ridiculous. They kept landing on the same shot. Main, you know, mainly the wrist on the train. And, you know, they were satisfied. We cut 17 frames out of it. And it doesn't really change in the impression. You know exactly what's going on. It's ridiculous. And I think they were just busting chops, you know? Were you both concerned with Martins? It was really bold. I mean, it was very sexual, and that was kind of a, a real venture for you guys to go more in that area. Were you concerned about controversy at all? I wasn't when we did it, but uh, Martin you know, I was so happy to get the bar and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll never forget one time after, actually, when I was seeing, uh, coming out, somebody did, did a radio show and asked me to be a guest, and they just blasted me like crazy about how could you be in such a vile thing. I'll never forget it. I was really blown away. <laughs> I mean, I, I was really, I never thought of it ever like that. That was really, but obviously something did. I never thought of it either. I mean, we, in those days we were doing what we wanted to do, you know, we were, we were outside the system and um, we were just doing it that way. And nobody ever thought about video or keeping a director's cut or, you know, trying to tame it down to get a wider release and then releasing it later on video because video wasn't a factor at that point. So. You've done so much in so many different genres, but of course everybody centers on the zombie films. Does that bother you that they don't talk about your other films as much as they do the zombie films? Do you feel like typecast maybe? Well, it's definitely, I'm definitely typecast in terms of this town mm -hmm. and what, you know, the kind of phone calls that I'm, that I'm ever going to get from producers. Mm -hmm. But uh, my fans are, I mean, it's really gratifying because uh, there are a lot of fans that, I mean, they're even, they're even, people that love Bruiser, you know, but, and uh, in the other ones, Night Riders, there are some, you know, there are people that really love Night Riders, and, so I'm delighted, you know. Yeah. So how are you treated in Pennsylvania? Are they treat you like the big stars you're treated out here, or just no. George? Yeah. 
There's nothing. I'm, I don't look for I mean, I'm sure Savini gets a cost. He lives in Pittsburgh, too. I'm sure he gets a cost on the street a lot more. But he's done on-camera stuff. And he, he, you know, he's sort of, I don't know, he's more of a, promotes himself a little more that way, you know? I generally don't. What do you think of Savini's idea to turn Barbara into a, uh, a butt kicker in his version of that kid? That was my script. So. Really? So actually you wrote that? Yeah. It was my apology to women. Because in the first one she was, you know, we were worried so much about politics and everything else that I forgot all about her. And she was this sort of typical, you know, 60s... Uh, damsel in distress, you know, falling down, losing her shoes, and doing all those stupid things, falling apart. So th the first thing that I wanted to do when we did the remake was uh, change her. Was it right in the original uh, that Barbara, your like, first draft or earlier draft of Barbara was supposed to make it to the night? Mm -hmm. No? No. There, there's been people that said that in, in, in the beginning you had intended for her to make it through and that you changed at the end. Boy, I, maybe maybe we had discussions about that. Yeah. I don't know. If that's in Jack's book, maybe. Because I don't remember half the stuff in Jack's book. He does. I mean, he was always more of a chronicler than than me. Well, there also was a rumor that an alternate yep. ending to Dawn of the Dead was filmed, and you denied it, but they said you said there was in other interviews. Yeah. So I've, was there or wasn't there? Yeah. Well, I, I realized... I didn't remember it. And I didn't remember we had shot... The, it was base footage. We never finished it. We just shot a, we did a take of her standing up into the helicopter blades. It was just a close-up. She stood up out of frame. And that's all we ever shot. She's killed. Huh? That's it. She's gone dead. Yeah. yeah, but we never did the effects work, the blood work, anything like that. Because it was right in there that I, we had shot that stuff earlier in the schedule. And then, uh, I, you know, after I changed my mind, I, you know, I, we just never came back to it. I just forgot that we had had that... Oh, it was okay. really that one shot that we took. Does that footage exist somewhere? I, I doubt it. None oh, of the extra great. footage. Yeah. None of the other footage exists. You know, in those days, nobody kept anything. Again, there was no no video. You know, nobody was thinking of director's cut or anything else in those days. What do you think about DVDs? They have all these extras and everything. You like that or? I think it's nice for camp. Yeah. yeah. I like the commentaries. I like getting together with people, you know, old friends and doing them. Some of the extras, I don't know, man. I mean, kind of makes you wish you'd kept more stuff. Huh? Yeah. Well, it always does that. I mean, yeah. we've been wishing that for for a long time. We never stop and think, you know, yeah. that anything that it might be valuable. We never did back then. Well, those but, guys were so busy doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like but I think they're cool. I, I, it, it amazes me sometimes that a, you know, a, a distribution company they can keep saying, "Well, this is a new version," or new, you know, they're not. I mean, there's 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 only so much footage that exists. Yeah. Now, the Living Dead really has become a brand name like Kleenex. I mean, there's all kinds of tissues, but you always say Kleenex, even though it's a different brand. <laughs> And I can imagine that leads to a lot of people confusing other people's films with yours. Does that bother you? Like, what do you get a lot about people saying, I, we're always hearing people saying, oh yeah, George Romero's uh, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, it's right. got to bother you, know? That, well, that, it doesn't, again, it doesn't bother me. It's, uh, you know, I did my thing and they did their thing. I don't, so I, I, don't, I don't get all crazed over stuff like that at all. It's, uh, it's just wrong, and you know, my the only, and I just don't like the Return of the Living Dead films mainly because they, I think they ripped Jack off. Jack and I made a deal with each other to, to that, hold each other harmless, and you know, basically I said, you you go what, do what you want to do, and I'll go do what I want to do, and we, you know, we gave each other the right to go and, and do whatever kind of sequel or book or anything else. Understand that uh, he wrote *Return of the Living Dead*, and they bought it from him on the promise that they would use the script and involve him. And the moment the deal was closed, they walked away and wrote their own thing. So Jack really had nothing to do with that script, and that 
pisses me off. Just, I just thought it was unethical. In Diamond Dead, if that actually does get made, what do you think your fans are going to think about you becoming more modernized, techie in the films? In what way? Or do you look at it that way? Well, rock band and, you know, so forth. It's very different. Very different. Yeah. It's it's, like, uh, it doesn't like get into like computers and, and video games and technology, any of that. I know I read you hate computers. Yeah, I just know they're not friendly to me. <laughs> <laughs> they break down regularly. Oh, for <laughs> everyone. <in> the club. <laughs> they're evil. As your son encouraged you to actually have a website, right? Yeah. He's excellent, by the way. Yeah, he, I don't, Very excellent. He did it from dad. You had a lot of but problems I don't, with the... Uh, but this is not techie. It's not, you know, not really. it's not, not in the script at all. And it's just... And we're not planning a lot of CG stuff or anything. So it's, even the production of the film is not going to be that that high tech, you know. I'll try to use it. Maybe if, you know, if we have a little bit of a CG budget, I'd try to use it, you know, to be amazing here and there, but not not to be any any sort of star, you know. The equivalent of taking off Gary Sinise's legs and gun, you know. You're really happy with who you are as, as far as being associated with horror. You don't want to make, like, the great romantic comedy or... I, I'd love to do other stuff. I mean, I'd be nuts not to want to do other stuff, but I'm, I'm, I am very happy. <laughs> you know, I always loved horror, and I'm happy to be where I am. I just wish people took it a little more seriously. I mean, studios. Um, it's, you know, it's really... I, I'm always much more concerned with sort of what lies beneath, you know, and what's this really about what's the allegory what's the metaphor and you can't even talk in those terms you know all, all these guys care about is uh, you know the, the front the story that lies on top and uh, what's unique about it you know and it, the weird thing is they might think it's unique if you change the hockey mask for a catcher's mask yeah that would be unique enough for them um, not me. You know, I, I'm always looking for a reason to underlie the, you know, and, and shore up the basic premise and what it is. So the stuff that I've written on spec, people look at it sometimes and go, what's this? They don't see the surface, you know. They don't see that, well, this can be a fun ride. I really thought after uh, Blair Witch that, you know, that might open some eyes. Yeah. And make them realize that you can do things simply. You don't need all the CG. You don't need all the garbage um, but uh, it hasn't <laughs> so that you so you, you get these hundred million dollar fantasy films and then you get you know three million dollar four million dollar fantasy films there's nothing down the middle you think when a major studio takes on what was formerly an independent film that this ruins the independent spirit that was made with very corporate absolutely I mean to some extent I mean look at Chainsaw and to some extent, that might happen to me uh, with this zombie film. But, you know, now I know that if I can make, I'll make, uh, basically what I'm going to do is make the film for video. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll push it as far as we can for the theatrical release, and hopefully it'll still be, you know, pretty hot and good. But I think, you know, as long as I, I know that, I, you know, the other footage, whatever I'm not allowed to put on the screen in the initial theatrical release and I know that I'll we'll have it in my hip pocket for video. So. What's your comment on the fact that your, your lovely wife is involved? I mean, the fact that she obviously loves what you do, she's involved in what you do, that's got to be so helpful and keep you so grounded because you are very grounded. You're, you're not all egotistical and everything like a lot of people. No, you know, How she helped you in that? Oh, tremendously. In more ways than that. I mean, I wouldn't be around. If it were, if it weren't for her, I mean, she. I don't she, love the bombs. She, I'll tell you. Really? Not, not a real big fan of horror. Or just no, actually not. Really? In general, I'm not, and I, I really hate it. terrible blood like guts. I hate it. But I've always, when I'm with George and he's making it, it's, like, it's, you know. I guess when I've been around when you're shooting the gory scenes and stuff, it really does. It bothers me hell. I would never do that. Really? No. Ever. So but it hasn't desensitized you by making the film? No. But you know, he doesn't do, you know, it's funny, those are isolated instances and you know, a lot of the films don't have any of that stuff in it. So where'd you two meet? I shot a film <laughs> in Chris's parents' house. 
shot season of the witch in their house. There you go. And she I was in New York. And she was it wasn't home. She was in New York. Uh, you know, trying to get a career as an actress. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, you know, we hooked up. Several years later, I guess. That's a lot of years later. Right? Yeah, seventy six. Yeah, seventy six. So four years later. That's fantastic. I love it when you guys uh, do your cameos. Like <laughs> both of you in Dawn of the Dead. Is that fun? Oh, it's fun. Oh, it's fun. Your classic line of stick it up your... Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's always fun. We haven't been doing it. Haven't got to do it. And Chris... Bruiser, I, Chris I was flunked into wearing a stupid thing on my head with a veil you know what he's... Ah, I felt rejected. She was, a, <laughs> she was a bird in the gilded cage. And is it right that a lot of the extras would get drunk because it was a pub at the mall in Dawn of the Dead? Oh, yeah. What happened there? Is there stories of any? No, you know what? Not too much. The, it was, I mean, it, everybody wound up being pretty respectful of the fact that... Really so there was no real um, vandalism or anything like that. There were a couple of little accidents, uh, but there was nobody was out to trash the place or anything. Which but they would. That. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. They had a lot of people. Everybody had respect for the... You know, the fact that they had to let us in there and that we needed the place and needed to, you know. That's because you didn't use Hollywood extra stuff. You know, uh, <laughs> you know what, probably. It's it probably is. because <laughs> it's targeted at the yes. economy. You know, everybody just seems really happy to be part of the film. And, and really, very respectful. It wasn't know. hard to talk to Maul and the doing it? Well, George knew the people that owned the mall and they were just very nice people and said, okay, go ahead. That's where I got the idea from taking a tour of the mall when they first built it and that gave me the idea you don't have to give me an amount if you don't want to they soak you a lot of money for using them all or no you know and i don't them? remember right? you'd have to ask richard about that but I, it wasn't much i think it was only, i think it was only around 60 grand or something. yeah when you think but they were that's friends that's that provided, huh? you couldn't build nothing like that for 60 grand. no no and they, and you know they were friends and everybody was you know at the time all the stores cooperated, you know, I know that was an advantage that we had over the remake. I know that a lot of people didn't cooperate and they couldn't use real real names on the stores. And, so. so what do you think of CGI in films? You know, I, 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 sometimes I like to look at it uh, just to sort of see how it was done or how inventive the people are being, but most of the time, it, in my mind, to me it gets in the way. I think when you see something that's impossible, it lifts you as much out of the movie as it does to see King Kong, you know. And uh, I'd rather have the, you know, the hands-on and be able to, you know, more appreciate the art. But, you know, when you see something that's just absolutely impossible, you're... I'm looking forward to seeing that movie that, yeah. What's the one about the weather one about New York? No. no. <laughs> I was seeing a thing. I mean, that looks like day incredible. After the, day after tomorrow. Okay, the yeah. effects look incredible on in that, actually. <laughs> well, I'm sure they are, but, you know, they, you, there's something about it. You just know it's a, you know it's a fact. Are you going to be working with Tom Savini anymore? I hope so. I hope so, yeah. You're still social with him then? Oh, yeah. Right I think he's over here. Really? I saw I saw him. Oh, yeah, we see him often. What about but I don't know whether he really doesn't want to do effects anymore. Really? He wants to act. Yeah. And he's got the school going and all that. So I don't know. I'd love to see him come in and do a role. Maybe in the thing. But it's a couple of his sort of graduates, uh, uh, Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger have this KMB company. So and they're also old Pittsburgh buddies. So your comment you made uh, about Hollywood that if you fail they write you off another statistic, and if you succeed, they pay me a million bucks to fly out to Hollywood and fart. Can you expand on that more? What do you mean by that? I think it's pretty, pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. I think it's pretty clear. Um, no, it's true. If you, you know, you fall off the radar very easily, and then you need to have another hit before they'll, you know. But, you know, they'll write a blank check. If, you're, if you have a success, and they'll, they'll just, you know, ask you, well, what, what would you like to do next? Whereas, you know, a couple of weeks before, you could be coming in and trying to pitch anything and not getting anyone. So, it's, uh, you know, that's been a frustrating thing, too. All that time, all that period of inactivity, you know, we, we really sort of fell off the radar. 
Yeah. And it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously, it has a financial effect, and it has a you know has an effect on your life in that you know you're sort of running out of years. You know, for how many more things you can do. So, to that extent, it's very you know it's very frustrating. But on the other side of it, I don't care. I mean, I never really was. Uh, My goal isn't to make Hollywood films. My goal is to just make films. And it, it's it's frustrating. But, but the problem anymore, it's hard to find financing. Financing. Independent financing. It, it's just gone. <laughs> and that's the problem. It has to hurt that the driving's gone, too. I mean, that had to yeah, have gone. Yeah, well, you know, that was... You know, in those days, Ben-Hur would play downtown for six months. And so this neighborhood screens and drive-ins were all available and that's really where the B movies came from and or that that's why they existed and that's why they were independent independent distribution companies that could line those screens up for you and, and get meaningful screens meaningful release um, you know once they started to to release movies across the board you know big wide releases then that's really what killed it uh, do you have any further contact with uh, any of the original cast members of the original Night of the Living Dead? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you see them at uh, these things like this, you know. We're always, I just saw her a couple of weeks ago at a Comic-Con in Pittsburgh. Uh, she's great. She was, she was Carl Hartman's daughter in real life, the guy that played the original Harry Cooper. And I saw them all there, man. Carl was there, Jack, Russ, uh, they were all at this Comic-Con. But it was in Pittsburgh, so. But they, they travel a lot, too. And, yeah, well, I bump into, you know, bump into them all over the place. Let me ask you this crazy question. One of the things that I remembered most about Night of the Living Dead is a little girl that scared the Jesus out of me. What is it about children horror films that seem to be so much scarier than adults? It's just a little more off, you know. It's, it's off, just that much more off-center. There's something automatically wrong about it, I think. And, and so... It just works. You, know? you didn't get any flack from the little girl, girl and her father like she did with a spade? Oh, we got flack for all that stuff way back then. I mean, we were just slammed, you know. The, uh, the MPAA didn't exist yet, so we were taking all kinds of heat for, you know, for being brutal. Roger Ebert did a big piece about kids running crying from the theater, you know. We didn't make the movie for kids, you know. I mean, we didn't put it on a double bill with uh, whatever it was on, you know. They were booking it on double bills with, you know, very benign little horror things and, or fantasy things. So, you know, we didn't do the bookings, and that's not what the movie was for, but I mean, we used to get, we really got dropped. But, uh, you know, I think in the end that helped us too, you know. I mean, it really didn't have a, a, a negative effect. Because when it went out in those drive-in theaters and neighborhood theaters, it actually returned money. It returned more money than, than we had spent to make it. You know what? We should go pretty soon. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm elderly.